Um, it's my pleasure to present some of this information today. My name is Jay Pepper Martins. I'm the CTO for the, C the association. I'm joined today by one of our most senior and knowledgeable MLS people, Andrew Dina. And How's it going, Andrew, everyone? Uh, yeah, good morning. And uh, we're happy to uh, deliver this class on stats, how to get to InfoSparks, which is a product uh, given to us by a, a company called Market Stats. And I'll touch a little bit on exports today, too. We are going to record today. And uh, because today is a fairly plain informational meeting, we're going to allow if people have chat transcript bots or anything else that they're using as an AI assistant, those are fine for today. Generally speaking, SFAR doesn't uh, permit the use of AI tools currently in our board meetings or in our other um, committee meetings, but for the purposes of a class today, it's fine. So today we're going to cover a few things. Uh, I think first thing that you might want to um, quickly do is if you can scan that QR code or I will grab this text and put it in the, where did it go? I'm going to grab this text and put it in the chat. You're going to want this today. This is the outline for the materials I'm covering today. There you go. And so today what we're going to be covering is some advanced search techniques, which is really sort of the underlying foundational principle of um, statistical analysis is knowing what data you're including or excluding. So we're gonna touch on advanced search techniques today. I'm gonna show you how to do some things in the MLS that maybe you didn't know or uh, haven't seen in a while and you need a refresher on. Then we'll jump into the MLS statistics. We'll look at the basic stats tools and the modules that come included in the MLS system. And then we'll jump over to InfoSparks which is the, the really cool visualization tool for all the stats uh, in the Bay Area. It's got all of the data in it from all of our partner MLSs that stretch from Sacramento through the North Bay, uh, obviously the whole peninsula and most of the Central Valley, all the way down to Monterey. And InfoSparks has all that data. I'll also do a, uh, an example where I show you how to use our exports. I might even uh, touch on a quick example in Excel on some things you might do there. And then lastly, you'll see on the last page of the handout, uh, there are some links to some other resources for beyond the session, and I'll sort of walk you through those a little bit to get you started. So that's what we're going to cover today. Um, hopefully that sort of meets what your expectations were for um, what you were expecting to see. So uh, here we are on the MLS dashboard. And uh, you can see here there are a couple of things that are unique right now that I'll call your attention to. Right now we're using one of these informational banners at the top. If you haven't checked on, uh, clicked on this yet, um, it takes you to a page that's in our solution center that will let you read what the current details are regarding the NAR settlement and how it affects uh, us as a realtor owned MLS. So you should go take a look at that if you've got any questions. These informational banners, you can also dismiss them. There's just a little click and the X there and you can have them go away. So today we're gonna to start off with the MLS itself. I'm just going to get loaded here and I might actually load it up in a different browser. Sometimes I'm having some trouble with Chrome. We'll see if Chrome's gonna cooperate today. Yeah, I'm having one of these issues with Chrome. I'm gonna bounce over to Edge. If you haven't been using Microsoft Edge for anything yet, it's actually pretty decent if you're on a Windows 10 or a Windows 11 laptop and you haven't taken another look at um, the Edge browser in sort of recent memory, you might want to. Um, it's got some pretty fancy stuff in it now with this technology called Copilot, which is driven by AI. Uh, I'm not going to touch on that too much today, but it's worth looking into if you're on a Windows computer. It actually is an, an Edge for Mac OS too, which also runs pretty well. So here we are today. Uh, we're going to get logged into the MLS. And we'll first of all start by looking at how to do search in a way that helps you get what you want. Um, and I'll start by sort of showing you a counter example of something that doesn't work. And then we'll uh, we'll work back to, to a first principle. So what I wanna show you is that if you go into a search and you decide you wanna look for some very specific things, you're looking for a, a condominium uh, in district five or 10 uh, in the County of San Francisco that's active, that was built after 1999 only, that has exactly uh, four or more bedrooms, so four to nine, let's set it. And um, there must be um, at least a thousand square feet of lot space. 
So as you can see, my client has maybe given me a bunch of details, things that are their minimums and maximums. And I've punched those things in. And now I'm going to see how many listings I got. And so sometimes what people will do is they'll get very few results when they've been hyper-specific like this. And then they will sometimes call the MLS for support. And they'll say, look, I think there's something broken in the MLS. I know there's got to be more than one house that's been built after 1999 that uh, is in these districts, blah, 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 blah. And the answer is there might be, but maybe some of the agents haven't input all the data. Maybe the year built isn't available in two of the listings. Maybe one of them has three bedrooms and a den. And so it's not coming back in this highly specific search. So the first principle that I want to make sure people sort of understand is the idea of searching wide and then narrowing down. So let's do an example of that. I'm going to reduce my criteria here significantly. I'm going to remove these entirely. And now by using the little preview count, I can see that I'm going to get more back. And if I click search results, I can look at my 47 listings. Oh, I accidentally broke it. It had 47 there for a sec. He thinks I got impatient and clicked too soon. There we go. Okay, so now we've got our 47 listings, and this is what I would call a breadth first search. Some of these aren't going to fit the criteria that my client has given me, but now that I can see all the data that's available, what this allows me to do is notice what uh, listings might be adjacent to the search. So maybe it's got um, three bedrooms instead of the four that they mentioned, but there's other rooms that are in the property. So it's important for me to also have a look at the ones that have three bedroom. Uh, I could even sort by bedrooms here. And so now I'd be looking at just the ones with the most count first. So here's my two with six and four, but there's a whole bunch with three. And so maybe some of these threes have dens in them and I'm going to want, going to, want to make sure my client doesn't miss out on that so the, the strategy that I'm showing you here is sometimes go a little bit above and beyond or, or outside of what your client might be looking for so that you can find more data and then bring more relevant examples, things that are, like I say, criteria adjacent to your client's requests. You can bring that to their attention. I mean, if there's a price reduction here on this listing that's uh, got lots of square feet. Yes, it maybe doesn't meet your minimum uh, bedroom spec, but they're looking, there's all these other things about it. Uh, so by searching for breadth first and getting as much data as possible, now I'm able to sort of remove the ones that are definite no matches. And the reason why I always show people advanced search stuff first is because using these search techniques to get data sets you up for doing things in statistics. So maybe I did only want the three bedrooms. So let's limit it to just the three bedrooms. And maybe I want to run some statistical um, report on that. So let's just set up for three bedrooms. And let's see what I got. That's seven. Okay, that's enough to be relevant. So we're going to pull these results. And now that I have a result set, I can choose to run a report. When you run a report, you can run one of these default reports but there's also ways to run the statistical reports. There's another button here called stats, statistics. And when you run this, you get a different way of a report. This is one that does stats on minimums, averages, mediums, and maximums of sort of the core, maybe handful of 10 or 12 fields that give you a really good snapshot of the data you're looking at. You can also look at charts. So there are built-in charts that let you visualize this data. Sometimes those are very interesting. Sometimes they don't show a lot. Um, maybe in this case, uh, the, the variance in mediums, uh, minimums, maximums, medians, and averages of the bathroom counts, maybe that's relevant. There's some analysis here of square feet, and you can see here some lot size. And so you can use these built-in reports however you want. You can set up for charts only. If you're not happy with the data you're getting back, you can also revise those search criteria, which will jump us right back outside to the search. And if the system's working on a good day, and it is, you see it reset all of my details exactly as I had them, including the three and three. Turns out my client doesn't care about being too specific here. So instead what they say is, 
anything in districts five to nine. I'm using a dash to say more districts. So that'll get me five, six, seven, eight, and nine. I can do the same thing and go back to stats. And this time we have more data. So now the graphs we're gonna get back are gonna look a little more interesting. This is graphs only I'm looking at now. And you can set it to graphs and stats charts. And so you might wanna take some of this that's interesting and put it in a presentation to one of your clients. Maybe you're putting together something yourself. Maybe you use a uh, word to accumulate things. Maybe you're fancy and you use Adobe InDesign. But what you can do is you can grab screen captures of anything that's in the MLS and you can put it into anything else that you're maybe preparing for your clients. So maybe you are using Word. And so if I go and get myself a brand new empty Word document, And I decide I want to put that in there. Um, you, know, you can put this in as part of your building a presentation uh, for a buyer or a seller. Now I'm on Windows, so I'm using a little tool for screen capturing called GreenShot. Um, Windows also has a built-in snipping tool. On Mac OS, there's lots of built-in snipping and shortcuts for activating the snipping tools. There's also a utility that's called um, Skitch. That's really, really great on Mac. And on the handout uh, that I linked in the chat window, on the last page, you'll find links that take you to where you can download those tools. Making screenshots of things in the MLS is an absolutely valid way of using the output. You don't always have to turn it into a report, run the report. I mean, this is a valid way to do it. You can do this. But you can also just take screenshots if it's important too, right? So right now I've I've gone through the work to click through and turn it into a PDF. And so I could print this or I could open it up as a PDF in the browser tab. You don't have to allow pop-ups. Always allow pop-ups for Rapitoni. So now I can use this. But again, never hesitate to screenshot or take elements out of the MLS if they help you with the presentation with your clients. So the last thing I want to cover about search strategy is the idea of looking at data from a period in time. So sometimes you might want to analyze data statistically from during the pandemic. Hey, why don't we do that? Why don't we look at all the residential data uh, for the city and county of San Francisco? This time, we're not going to look for active data. We're going to turn that off. Instead, what we want is all the closed data that's between a period. So what I could do is I could check off closed and I could say, well, let's see, when did the pandemic start, Andrew? It was like March 1st of yeah, 20th. I think so. Something like that, or like March, maybe we can even call it March 10th. And we could say the pandemic ended maybe the end of 2022. Again, I'm just making this up. So if I say, give me all the closed ones that are closed between these two dates, I can in fact get a lot of data back. I can get back all of the data that transacted for that two and a half years. And you can see that inside the County of San Francisco for residential listings, wow, there were 17,382 transactions. But I'm gonna show you something else. What if you'd like to know how many listings were active for some of this period? Well, what if we said, like, give me all the ones that were active at the beginning of the pandemic through to maybe, I don't know, summer of the pandemic. So give me all the listings that are active between this period. And when I run this preview count, I'm gonna get a pretty disappointing result. And the reason for that is that I'm saying, give me all the listings that are active now that were active in this period. Here's where the magic happens. I'm gonna uncheck active, but I'm gonna put those dates back in. So now I've once again said March 10th through to July 1st of 2020, but notice how the checkbox is not checked. Now when I run the count, I get a non-zero value. Why? Well, these dates are looking for any listing data that were active because I'm using the active row between these two dates, but not that are active now, which is what the checkbox indicates. So when I actually go ahead and I'm going to narrow this down a little bit so I'm not pulling quite so much data. Let's just pull stuff from district three. Much more manageable. Okay. So what are we saying? 
in District 3 in San Francisco, give me all of the residential data that was active with an active date that fell within the pandemic date of the sort of when it was really bad. So now I can view those results. I'll get just my standard grid. And the really cool part about this now is you can see that the status column shows you what the ending statuses were for the listings that were active in that period. That's pretty fascinating. Some of them closed, lots of them did. One of them was canceled and a few of them just simply expired. So why am I showing you this? When you're doing statistics, sometimes you might be interested in data from a period of time that was in a certain disposition. So you might wanna look for how much data sold off the MLS during the pandemic, or you might wanna look back 10 years and say, how many listings did we have then? Or what was the average days on market for you know a certain type of house then, as opposed to now? And you'll be able to use this date strategy to pull back data regardless of how it ended up. So again, if I'd have checked off closed, I'd have gotten less data. Let's prove that. So we're gonna take these dates and put them into closed. So now we're gonna get anything that was active in that period, but also the ones that were closed. And so now when we pull this result, it's gonna and those results together. And you can see that some data is going to be missing. Now all we see is closed data. So you can be very clever about your combination of these checkboxes and dates. Here's something else that's interesting. Let's maybe make this a little more current. How about quarter one of this year? that have closed already. So show me anything that was active since the first of this year that's now closed. The closed checkbox means give me ones that are in status closed. The two dates tell me which range they must have been active in, in districts three through seven. Two hundred and twenty three listings have been open since the first of the year that are now closed. If I view the results, you'll see that they'll all have the status closed. So basically what I'm looking at here is all closed transactions since the first of the year, excluding anything that has come after this month. Now it's still in March. So let's make this a little more concrete. Let's go ahead and reduce the active date to just what opened in January. Might be interesting. 113 listings opened in January of this year, of which, no, sorry, more than that open, if I uncheck closed and check the count, I'm going to get more than 113, 210, of which 13 are now closed. So now I'm basically looking at how much data closed in January. Okay, so that's the advanced search stuff I want to cover. I touched on the basic built-in stats a little bit. I'm going to stop here, and Andrew, let's check and see if there's any questions. I don't know that we'll have any yet. No, nothing's come in just yet. Um, okay. Yeah, I think I think this is a great advanced search technique that you're showing people. This um, this actually elaborates a little bit more than we get in the hot sheet, and it's often um, overlooked. So thank you for going over that, Jay. That's a great thing to point out is a hot sheet is essentially this type of, of advanced clever searching with only a few days of um, like change history, right? Some people will run a hot sheet for 24. They'll run a hot sheet for three days in a certain district. And hot sheets are basically doing some of these advanced things I'm showing you. They're just tucking it under the hood because uh, a hot sheet search will basically say, show me all the changes for any of these types of criteria within a certain range. So that is a more manual, what I've shown you is a more manual way of running hot sheet like searches for any period of time, for any disposition of listings, for anywhere in the NorCal Alliance. There's a question here, a chat about uh, the grid. Yes, you may have noticed that my grids that I'm using look different. 
Um, and the reason for that is that I have at one point customized them. And I'll just quickly touch on that just so the people know how to do it. Oh, to get a couple of listings, great. So when you're in any of your grids, you can always click on customize grid. And when you do that, it'll allow you to choose which fields to include and which ones to exclude. And it is extremely flexible and shows you literally everything that's available in the database. So you'll see that even in some cases where we've got like similar fields that represent some of the same data, uh, you might have to pull in, you know, multiple copies of the field and see which ones, maybe one of them is a deprecated field or maybe one of them comes from one of our data share partners. So don't hesitate to put in a lot of the fields in and then on the right side, you can remove them one by one if you determine that they don't have anything useful in them. And then of course you can reorder things. If I wanted the, um, the DOM uh, to appear very close to the front, I could change its index number to number 07. And now DOM jumps up to the top. And you can customize your grid for each individual property type. The reason that's important is that each property type has a different set of fields that could be associated with it. So the fields available for residential may be different than the ones available for land. Of course, there's a handy little restore. Go ahead. No, I thought you were finished. Go ahead. Oh, just a handy little restore defaults button. If you really, you know, bork it and you move some things around, or maybe you accidentally clear everything and you didn't mean to, you can always just click your little restore defaults. Andrew? Uh, I see another question in here that's asking how uh, they can get a handout. I'm not too sure which handout they're referring to. I don't know if you're uh, just looking for a printout of the oh, stats. Uh, here's the link again. I'll put it in the chat window. You can click on that for Eve. Um, this will get you the handout for today's Perfect. class, and we are recording today. Perfect. And just a reminder, folks, if we can have the uh, questions addressed in the Q&A section, and then we'll answer them either live or in the chat. Okay. So now that we've looked at how to search data and get data into grids, Let's leave that aside for a second and talk about this product called InfoSparks. This company called MarketStats um, has integrated with our MLS and has successfully downloaded all of the data for the entire NorCal MLS Alliance data share. So instead of just having stats that have the data inputted by um, the SFAR MLS members, there's actually a NorCal MLS Alliance map that shows you everything that's in our MLS group. So InfoSparks has data that covers all of these areas. That is the entirety of our data share in Northern California. It's pretty good. So when I go to the InfoSparks tool and it defaults me to the county and city of San Francisco, that's usually a good view to start from. As San Francisco agents, that's primarily what we're concerned about is our own home county. And you can see here that there's this thing called organization below it. And one of the links is all source MLSs. <clears throat> what this means is that the orange trend line, which in this case is sales price median, is combining all data where the city and county of San Francisco, regardless of which MLS was used to input it. I could just look at data for San Francisco. I could just look at data that's been brought into our system from the South Bay called MLS listings. But generally speaking, you're always gonna to wanna to look at all of the data in a given geographical region, regardless of its origin. So just looking at the InfoSparks basics, you can see that I've already touched on this little county indicator. I've touched on the data source indicator called organization. And then to the right of that, there's price range, subtypes, bedrooms, and square footage. Now these brackets are set up sort of intelligently by the system. It looks at how much data fits into these brackets and creates four. <laughs> For the property subtype, it's reading those directly from our MLS system. For the bedroom, it's using those counts directly out of our database. And for the square footage, it's done this sort of intelligent bracketing the same way it did for price range. Now in these intelligent bracketing ones, there's a custom button and that lets you set your own brackets if you wanna create Maybe you only care, uh, so let's set this one to square footage. Let's go to 5,000. And then I'm gonna create my own bracket for 5,001. I'm gonna save that because maybe I only care about mega houses. I only wanna see the ones that have a lot of square foot. So I've created my own special 
five thousand foot bracket and up using the custom button. So let's set it back to all sizes, all bedrooms, all styles, so that again, I'm looking at all the data. Of course, we've just been using the sales price report, but I could have been picking from any of these indicators. And there are quite a few down here. So let's take a look at a few of them. I won't walk through them all, but you can see that new listings is usually a good indicator of how much inventory is coming to the market. So you can see here that I'm looking at a three-year line that's averaging the last three months of data. So this value is an average of three data points. This is an average of three data points. And so this graph may not be exactly the same number as the exact number that were new in the month of May, 2023, because this is creating a trend line with some smoothness to it. If I wanted to make that a more jaggedy line that shows me the exact counts, I can turn off smoothing. So you can see here where it says the summing, I've gone to monthly. So now these are the exact counts that were true for that month. As you average more data, so the default is rolling three, which creates very uh, visually sort of interpretable data. I can make it even longer, but watch what happens to the lines. They're gonna become less defined and they show you sort of really broad trends as opposed to very specific seasonal trends. So the broad trend is a reduction in the number of new listings since 2021. Now we also had a really crazy 2020 and 2021. A lot of new data came on the market. It was actually very busy. Instead of just looking at three years of history, what if instead we wanted to look at 10 years? Wow, that sure paints the picture that those period of time, that period of time during the pandemic was an anomaly. Our inventory was historically very low for new listings coming on the market. All of a sudden there was a spike and statistics tools like InfoSparks lets you sort of see that without having to do a lot of complicated Excel graphing or uh, using some other weird statistical model tool. This thing's very flexible and lets you look at data. Let's look at um, how many sold. So we see a line that follows pretty closely what our new listing line did. You can see here that there was a drop, right? So when all those listings came on the market at the end of 2020, they weren't initially moving. However, into 2021, the rising inventory, plus there were people closing transactions. All of a sudden we saw a lot of transaction volume. You might've seen some doom and gloom. Let's talk about that three years again. Let's go back to a rolling three months. And if someone said to you, only 827 sold listings in February, oh no. Well, there were also 861 in March and February was 761. But look at the ones before that. They were really, really high. And the further you go back, the higher they are. So sometimes when someone says that it's down 10% year over year, I mean, that may be true. Maybe it's even down 15%. But if you take a longer view of something and smooth it out, well, yeah, like no wonder the numbers appear lower here compared to the numbers here. But what if we were comparing the numbers now to numbers from eight years ago or five years ago? I mean, yes, we're still down in some ways in some metrics, but it also paints a more clear picture that perhaps this block of data here was an anomaly. And where we're really at now is sort of a more correct market. And the statistics tools in InfoSparks help you visualize that easily. Also allows you to have a conversation with your clients, right? They're asking questions like, you know, why is my house going to have a longer days on market? And you'll be able to indicate to them, well, maybe some of the hotness currently isn't there. Um, and here's the data that supports that. But don't, you know, be scared because that was a period of really high, crazy activity. And so now we're getting into a more normal. I mean, you'll you'll be able to use the data to tell a story in a way that makes sense for you and your client. Hey, Jay, as cool as this stuff is, you know, this is just a member benefit tool that we can see if we have access. I see a share button there next to print. What exactly does that um, entail? I mean, oh. how, how can we share this with uh, prospective clients? That's a great question. So let's say we are doing that exact story. We've decided that we want to show three years of data. We want to do a three-month rolling average, and we want to show them uh, maybe how many new listings there are because we're trying to tell them this is a good time to come on the market. There's not a lot of inventory. See how historically there was more or whatever. So you've, you've got that story in your head. You want to share this information. There's a little share icon here. When I click on that, I'm presented with some options. 
There are the static option, which means that it's basically going to take a picture of this and let me send a picture. Or I can make it a live link, which means that it will refresh every month. When the new stats get crunched by the system, the link, which I'm going to create, will continue to update. So we can make it as a static PDF. And when you make a PDF, it's always static. But if you turn it into an embeddable link, uh, let's make it bigger. You're going to get this little blob of code. Now in here, there is a hyperlink URL, which I'm going to put in the chat window. And I encourage everyone to click on it and let me know what they see. When you click on that, what do you see? Uh, looks like we get a screenshot of uh, new listings. Isn't that neat? Yeah. If you just want to grab that URL, the emailable and social media pasteable link will work. So I could grab this. I could then go over to my social media thing of choice. Like maybe I want to go to LinkedIn and I want to talk about what's happening in the market. Uh, I would, you know, frame the graph with my own narrative, you know, talking about why it's important to me. Uh, why this data is relevant to you as my potential clients. And then I would put that link in there so that it links it back to the report. Uh, and then we have a few questions in the chat here. One of which is, um, what is the best way to understand the difference between rolling months versus singular months? That's a great question too. Thankfully, um, I don't have to remember and you don't have to remember either. There's this thing up here called user manual and FAQ. It's a button in the top. I'm going to click it. And one of the things it takes us to is the help page, understanding all the things I'm explaining today. And in here, it's got a fantastic section that explains the variables that we were talking about across the top, how to do those custom ranges. And then down here, Where's the thing on the formulas? There's a thing on here about that. Um, there it is, time calculations. So in here, it's got a really good description of how all that works. Oh, nice. And you put that in the chat for us. Thank you. Yep. So for any given month, go back X number of months. If you've chosen 12, it'll be 12 months. If you've chosen three, it'll be three months. So from any given month, say March, go back three months, add those three numbers up and divide by three. So that you're getting the average of the last three months. This flattens out the line statistically, which is why when we were applying the different years, let's go back to the chart. If I set, let's do a long view again. If I set more averaging, it will smooth these lines out because now it's going back, not three months, but it's going back six months, adding up the values and dividing by six to get this value. It's going one, two, three, four, five, six, adding those up, dividing by six. That's how it got that value. If I set this for 12, it's going back a full year. So the 12 month sum and average gives you the most smooth line, which is really useful when you want to look at the overall global trends of something. Nice. So I can look back into 10 years of days on market and see that, oh, okay, we actually are at a statistically high value that was only hit during the pandemic and was previously only hit uh, when we had some fairly long average days back in 2017. And then prior to that, you know, we're getting close to the end of the um the the, uh, the tarp era hopefully that answers that question yeah and then we have one more here jay yep. um, can the end user in a live link share editable i don't recall that option i think we we set it up and whatever is there is what it is is that correct yeah let's pull one and let's do an example so i've just chosen to pull the data oh i said oh i should have said social media there we Okay, great. So let's do an example of this. Uh, for those who maybe don't know off the top of their head, um, Chrome has an incognito function, which is like no one's logged in. It doesn't have any in my history. So I'm not authenticated as me. I'm not Jay Pepper Martins. I'm just some nobody on the internet that got this link. And so when I put this in, 
you can see that it generates that report for me. It's branded. It's got the information from my profile and InfoSparks. Make sure you fill that out. So what could they do with this? Well, I'm a client. I just got this sent to me. I can share this page. I can get a link from it. I can share it in a Gmail message. I could share it to Teams. I could put it on my Amazon wish list, which is a weird thing to, to have implemented. But it's all here. You can see this is the add to any component. Uh, or I can run this off as a PDF for myself. And when I click that, here's a printable version of the graph my agent sent me, my agent J. So that is the full extent of what they're capable of doing uh, when they get a copy of it. They can uh, reshare it, which is just a static link, or they can print it, but they can't change the metrics that you're measuring on. And then does that link ever expire? Do we have to refresh the link at any point? So it, it'll depend. If you use a static link and you generate this, this link will stay the same forever and will never change. So this link will last an, an unreasonably long amount of time, uh, which is to say that it's not like this is a graphic generated on some server that's going to disappear. What this key is, is it says regenerate this graph with a certain set of parameters from the database, but they store those forever. I mean, I can use links that I um, that I started from InfoSparks. I could go back to links that I used when I started teaching this class in 2018, and they would still work. If you okay. use a live link. Yeah. Yeah. So let's flip it over and use the live link instead. Let's embed this. So I'm going to take this code. I'm going to stick it in. Same thing. It's using the oh. same codes. In this case, it happens to know under the hood that it should update every month, but that's going to last virtually forever. Like the, again, these links that we generate today are no mm -hmm. different than the ones I generated eight years ago, which also still work. Um, there used to be a blog I used to go to where I had seen one agent embedding the graphs from InfoSparks on their blog and the blog covered data from 2015, 16, 17, and all the links and graphs still worked. Nice. Anything else for questions? Uh, they were asking if we were using incognito for one of them, but I think it was just the link that you were displaying. Yeah, just to show that um, as an unauthenticated user, someone who might receive that, a client maybe that you're trying to work with, um, I didn't have to log in. I didn't have to create some account with you. I was able to just use the data that you sent to me. And I was using incognito to sort of prove that. Yeah, that was it so far. Okay, cool. So the last thing that's cool is don't hesitate to look at these details across the bottom. There are so many cool things you can look at. How many listings sold over list? Um, how many listings got their list price or greater or less? You can see here that there was a blip where <clears throat> it's true that the San Francisco listings, we are in SF County, were selling for a little bit below their list price. There was a moment there. Let's compare that. So now I've got two tabs at the top. I've got one with San Francisco County, my original orange one. I'm going to change this other one to look at, um, how about is Sonoma a county? I believe it is. Let's take a look at Sonoma's data. All right. So Sonoma, looking at three years of data, let's look at five with a three months summing average. Um, looks like Sonoma was hit a little worse for that sort of period. Uh, in general, they get a little less than, um, they don't go for as much over list price as the city does. But this lets you compare two counties. Uh, <clears throat> again, imagine this is something like a client's wondering, well, how many homes are going to be available in a certain county? Maybe not Sonoma. Why don't we do Monterey? You can say, well, there's going to be more homes available. The month's supply means that we're going to have a sort of more robust inventory in the city than you're going to have in Monterey. And the reason that that may be is Monterey is a little more remote. Maybe there's just not as much density. What about San Mateo? Oh, similar, actually. They've got less supply in San Mateo, too. So right now we're showing pretty good supply um, in terms of month supply um, in our current inventory. It's pretty robust. What does it actually mean for number of active listings? Let's take a look at that. Yeah, so right now we do have quite a few active listings. Historically speaking, um, there was uh, like this glut of inventory here during the pandemic. And again, just a stretch to 10 years, I can see that 
You've got, you know, the inventory is a lot right now, but we've had inventory this high before. This isn't like it's a unique thing. People shouldn't be wondering or, or thinking, oh my God, there's, you know, so many homes everywhere, all the house prices are going to crash. I mean, that wouldn't be what I would infer. Okay, so that was a pretty good walkthrough of the basic tools in InfoSparks. The last thing I want to show you at is a, a really cool customizable feature called My Areas. So you can see that right now, everything is divvied up in that report section by county. You can also use the San Francisco districts. You can also use city names. But what if I really just want to know something about San Francisco? Well, I can build my own area. I definitely don't want to be out there. So I'm going to draw my line here. Maybe I don't want to live in certain spots. Uh, I'm looking to go to there and then up and then here. I'll take you this. I don't mind living around here. Great. Okay, so what we've done is we've created a little polygon here and we're gonna call it, um, save that as, call it uh, North Beach Plus. That's cool. It told me that my polygon I just made has six square miles and 40,419 listings historically are in it. Neat. What can I do nice. with this? Let's go back to the InfoSparks tab. And again, we were looking at San Francisco County and let's go look at that, uh, how many have sold. And then let's do a comparison. And this time we're gonna go to my areas. And, oh, Chrome is overriding that. North Beach Plus, there we go. So here is the look at how many listings sold just in my little defined area. And here's how many sold in the whole city. But maybe we'll look at... Uh, what's on market? So what do the days on market look like when I'm comparing that area? Well, apparently it's properties that are in that North, North Beach Plus that I defined have a slightly higher um, days on market. And let's look for um, sold prices. And you can see that the area I've defined is very expensive. Again, this is a tool you're communicating with your client. They've indicated, they've drawn their uh, sort of polygon on a map. They said, this is an area I'm interested in. You've said, no problem. I'll get you some stats for this area. And when you show them the report, it it'll, it paints a picture for them that, you know what, the, the prices in this area are going to be a lot higher. And you can ask them how they feel about that. But you'll be showing them data. It won't just be your opinion that the properties are going to be more expensive in that area. You'll be demonstrating very quickly. And if you were doing this maybe side by side sitting with your client on an iPad, you could be sort of working some of these scenarios with them in a really cool interactive way that demonstrates your expertise and your sophistication in looking at data in a market area. Very cool. This reports tab has some great stuff on it that's built in for you. So if you just want to look at maybe all of the city, so show me the monthly indicator for uh, January of this year view report. This will spit out a pre-generated report for you with some metrics. There's some averages, some medians in here, some year-to-year -year comparisons. I warned you about being careful about <laughs> comparing anything to 2020, 21, and 22 are a little bit weird. So, you know, watch out for data telling you things that it's just revealing an anomaly. It's not actually showing you a trend. But you could, if you, um, maybe new year, new listings were what's important to your client, the rest of this doesn't matter. So maybe I'll just grab this and I'll put that into that uh, informational package that I mentioned that I'm going to work with a uh, client. I'm going to develop a package for them. They want to know about new listings. So maybe you just grab one page out of these indicator reports. I was also able to um, look at local market updates for a district. I could look at just District 9. I could look at District 9 from the height of the pandemic if I wanted to. This goes back pretty far. Let's look at it uh, in that 2020 period there where things were crazy. And so when this one looks at its, you know, 2020, 2019 to 2020, like 172% increase in pending sales. Wow. 
right? The pandemic was a really strange thing. And so these reports let you sort of take these snapshots in history and, and analyze them. So don't, don't forget that those are all there. There's also an annual report, usually comes out around February of every year. So the new 2023 report's available. And again, these are written from a national perspective, uh, comparing our housing market against the national averages. So you're going to find some stuff in here that doesn't make sense because for our local market area, um, we don't care what the national uh, sort of trends or we defy the trends. But nonetheless, the report generates some pretty cool year-over-year -year analysis that you might find useful. Any other questions about the fast stat stuff, Andrew? I'm sorry, say that one more time, Jim. Uh, about the InfoSparks, any other uh, questions? No, no questions just yet. Um, you guys feel free to feel free to throw those in the chat if anything comes up. We definitely encourage participation. Cool. Okay, while people are thinking about if they have any questions, I'm going to get myself set up here for the last section where we're going to talk a little bit about um, exports. Nice. Okay, so here I am back on my search. I'm going to do a pretty broad search. I'm selecting all types of residential data. By unchecking subtypes, I'm getting literally all of them that are in this subtype group, as long as they have the root type of residential. I'm going to pull the data for the County of San Francisco. I want to look at all the data that closed for 2023, but maybe I also want to find any data that closed at the end of 2022. So you see, I'm going to open up my bracket a little bit here. I'm going to get anything from December 15th of 22, and I'm going to get all the way through until um, the 15th of January this year so that I for sure am capturing everything from 2023. Notice that it's with a closed date within those parameters. So let's get a preview count. So there were 4,388 residential listings closed. This is too many to work with in the grid. So what are my options? Maybe I really do want to look at all 4,388 listings. My options are to run an export. So when I click on that fancy little button, I want to get sort of the basic listing life cycle. So I'm going to do a system basic listing export. I'm going to submit that. I have to wait patiently. And I get one file. It's a zip file. Thankfully, on most modern computers now, they'll unzip a zip file with no problem. I'm going to save this on my own computer. I'm going to put it in my downloads directory, something handy. Cool. Save it there. All right. So let's go check out that zip file. Come to me, Windows Explorer. All right. So here, we've got our zip file. On Windows, if I double click it, it takes me into the zip file. On Mac, if you double click it, it'll say it's unpacking or unarchiving. And it will usually put it in the same directory as you found it. There are some utilities <clears throat> for unzipping files. And if you downloaded the handout, you'll see my favorite one is on the, the Windows page. It's called 7-Zip. And um, the one on Mac that I use is called the unarchiver. But you can see here, 7-Zip lets me do a bunch of things. It's like extract here, extract to a folder with the same name as the zip file, extract somewhere else. So I'm just going to extract it here. There we go. So now I get the CSV file. Well, that's great, Jay. What do I do with a CSV file? Uh, well, what you can do with a CSV file is you'll see that it's even got the icon for Excel on it. On your Mac computer, it might show you the one for um, pages. On, um, if you're using Google, uh, you'll need to go into Google Sheets and you can import data. Because I'm using a Windows computer today, I'm just gonna use Excel. So um, my options are I could double click it, but I'm gonna use this more, uh, more flexible feature where I'm gonna start off with a brand new worksheet. There's nothing in it. It's a blank old workbook. All right, so here I have a blank worksheet. And one of the tabs in here is data. And one of the options I can do is get data. Oh, I love getting data. Let's get data from a file. Let's get data from a text CSV file. And then let's go dig that file out of my downloads directory. 
And again, some of the little nuances for how you pull data into either um, Google Sheets or on a Mac, if you're pulling it into the analysis tool on, Map, on, on Mac, which I think is called Calc. I might have said Sheets a minute ago. It's actually called Calc. Um, so now I'm going to go to my downloads. I'm going to import this data. So the, the steps might be a little different, but you'll always end up with a grid with all of your data laid out like this. Ah, interesting. Excel can tell there's columns. And so Excel says, hey, this looks like column data, which it is, and I'm going to take advantage of that. Do I want to do any transformations? What are transformations? I could basically tell it this field is a date time. This one's a dollar amount. I'm not going to bother with any of that. I'm just going to let it load all the data because I can do all this manually in Excel. So I'm just going to say, go ahead and load it all. Just loading it up. And there we go. So Excel does a bunch of really cool things for me. It knows I'm working with um, a data set. So it sets up these little filters. So check this out. I can come and filter on property subtype. Again, what is this data? It's all the closed data from 2023. Maybe I do not care about most of these property types. I actually just want to look at anything that's like co-living. Co so show me all the co-ops, condos, maybe if it's co-ownership or the, the TCLA, which is the, the tenancy and commons. So I'm going to turn those all on. So now I'm just looking at that data for that set of property subtypes that I've checked off. You'll see that there's some numerical information here. So there's the, oh, cool, the area stuff is in here. That's excellent. List prices here. Is closed price here. Let's keep scrolling and check and see if we get closed price. So there's selling price. So I do have my start price and my selling price, which means I could, if I wanted to get fancy, I could insert a new column and I could say that this value equals the delta, right, between the selling price minus the list price. And I hope it's a positive number if you want to see these things sell for more than they list. So boom. So I put that in and Excel, if you're using the most current version of Excel, look what it did. As soon as I put in that formula, it knew to auto fill in every other field all the way down the spreadsheet. It knew to fill it in. So what I've got here now is the difference in price. something that maybe I could have generated using those statistical reports in the MLS. It would have been clumsy and bulky, or I could have gotten it out of InfoSparks. But what's really cool about doing it this way is now I've even got the APN numbers. I've got the exact address information. I've got the district information, which I could also filter on. So this kind of analysis in any kind of an external spreadsheet tool lets you really dig into the data and flexibly analyze it without having to like refresh the MLS and get a new stat report. Like let's imagine that we really just cared about district nine for some reason, I don't know why, but maybe we just care about district nine. So now we can also just look at the data for district nine that fit into those subtype descriptions that we were looking at before, condos, TICs, um, cooperatives. Very powerful stuff. Of course, Very, yeah. for, from these kinds of views, you can even go one step further. And I'm not going to do the whole example, but I'll show you one that I had done previously. Um, we had uh, done a presentation for the building boom um, back in 2021. They wanted to know, you know, how many listings in the MLS are coming from outside the MLS. So I did exactly what I just showed you. I pulled all the data for the city. And I also included a field in here called source MLS. And I was able to say, of all the listings for this period, uh, 1,202 of them came from us, our own agents. 81 of them were imported from the South Bay, and almost 50 of them came in from the agents of the East Bay. So this is a good way for me to sort of demonstrate to people, you know, the majority of listings in San Francisco still come from San Francisco agents. And I was able to graph this by, first of all, 
doing a listing data export exactly like I just showed you. And then I also did, you know, a couple of other fancy things. I did some summing. I created these, you can see on the side here, I created these things that group data, um, all things you can learn how to do. Um, we're not going to cover it all today, but uh, you can see how exporting the data into a flexible tool like Excel, you might be using Google Sheets or the one on Mac, um, lets you do some pretty fancy things that are very difficult to do if you think you're stuck with just the MLS view. You're not. You can export the data. And the uh, the export frameworks that seem to make uh, the most sense, uh, you're going to find out, go to back, back to export options. The ones that are great are the system basic listing export. The listing lifecycle data export is date centric. So it'll have all the dates in it. When was it on market? When did it go pending? When did it finally close? Did it, was it canceled? So the listing cycle data export has dates, really heavy dates in it. And then we still support an older um, protocol called Realty Tools. This is really just a very rich data set. It's got lots and lots of columns in it. Remember to pull that without photos if you're going to pull that data set, because then you'll get a lot of column data, but you won't also be forced to download I know, several gigabytes of photo data, which is what this one will force you to do. Very cool. Well, I think I'm almost out of time, um, but I will stop here and see if we have any other final questions. We have one question here. Um, can you please redo the district polygon search and display that you were you doing? Bet. Yeah, Thank no you. problem. So again, uh, I'm over here in San Francisco County uh, in InfoSparks, just have the data for the whole city, regardless of where it's from. But my uh, client has said they have a very specific thing they're investigating. Maybe for some reason they um, really want to know all about the data that's around Menlo Park or Merced, sorry. So- no, areas on the drop down it looked like oh yeah yeah so across the top i clicked on my areas perfect thank you and then down here i'm going to pick the polygon tool so i can define my own edges and then uh for whatever reason they've decided they want to live around here they want to stay on this side of the major artery so i could call this uh your said Thirty-one square miles. Wait a minute, data close. Oops. Oh, I accidentally destroyed my. Oh shoot. So what did I do? Instead of uh, clicking save, I accidentally clicked in the drop down. So now I've selected this other area. I'm just going to delete that. Yes, delete that. I didn't mean to do that. Uh, let's go back to San Francisco. How did I do that? I clicked on the little blue San Francisco button, and then I'm going to scroll back into my area. and redefine it. Oh, sure, we'll live on the other side of John Daly. There we go. Now I click save, call it Merced, there we go. 2.2 square miles, that looks more reasonable. Nice. And again, once you have your polygon, now you can go back to the InfoSparks page. You can compare the entire city to your custom area. Very cool. So the price per square foot around Merced is lower than the city's average. And then how does that compare to maybe all of District 3? So there you go. So what am I looking at here? I'm looking at three values, SF's District 3, the Merced District that we created for our client who maybe is going to university, and the SF County average, which would be the whole city and county. And so you can graph these numbers and share them with your client. Get static. Let's make it social media emailable. And again, just for fun, you can take a look at what this looks like in the chat window. I'm going to paste the link there. Please go ahead and click on it. And you'll see that you're going to get a graph with my mug on it um, displaying this data that we've just selected. Yeah, we do see that. Very cool, Jay. Thank you. Don't forget to go set your profile up. 
I'll put your email address in, you know, whatever you want to have appear on the report. This is the data that appears on the report. Oh, I might have not updated my title. Oops. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for coming today. Hopefully you found this useful. We did record it. Uh, we might chop some sections out of it uh, and then we'll get it uploaded. You can always find all of our videos for the association on the SFAR social YouTube channel. Um, so don't hesitate to go there and check things out. In fact, I think I have to type YouTube first. There we go. And you'll see here everything we do. Classes, if we had a new form come out, you know, if Dan Hershkowitz did a class on that, that'll be there. Um, so don't hesitate to come and check out our um, YouTube page with all of our videos. Thanks, everyone. We'll catch you all soon at an, an upcoming class or maybe at an in-person event. Appreciate it, Jay. Thank you. No problem. Everyone have a great morning.